Hi, I'm Marty Johnson. I'm here to introduce to you some figure four training modules we put together in our labs so that you can be successful the way we're successful in our lab. Our goal is to give you the information that we have and be able to go through and set your parts up from beginning to end so that when you get your parts off, they actually meet the design and intent of your application. Module two is a figure four basic theory of operation. And I have told you who I am. I am, I am still your host and I'm still Marty Johnson and we'll continue on through there. The learning objective for the basic theory of operation is to educate the learner or user on a basic theory of operation for figure four standalone and modular printers. The goals for this module is are that the student will be able to understand the basic print process for a DLP printer, understand the key components of the printer system, understand the graphical user interface on the standalone printer, understand the work cell user interface or the controller interface on the modular printer, and understand where to get detailed information on the printer hardware. For the basic theory of operation, it is based on a couple of number of principles, and these are going to be the six that are listed here. One is to define the part intent or application of the part. Very important. Uh, to, to go in and get a good print, to get success as quickly as possible on your printer system, you want to know what, are, what is my application, what is the intent of my part. We're not just going to stick an STL in there in, in any orientation and push go because that may not give you the right supports and it may not give you the right positioning to get the best part print result for your intent or application of your part. I'm going to show you how to prepare the part in 3D Sprint, select material for the part intent, the elevator system, which provides a z-axis motion to create the print, the light source and digital projection to polymerize the material, and to post-process the part. Again, defining the part or the intent of the application of the part is important. The part that's shown here, if you look at what's important, what makes this part usable once the user prints this part and post goes through the post process. And if you look to the right, they're numbered. There's, this part has intended mounting flat, is intended to be mounted flat based on where the screw hole location is. And so you've got a datum surface on the bottom of this part. So it needs to be a flat part. The part has three locations for large tubing that fits into holes. So this is used as a junction type so that you can pass air or, or liquid of, what, of whatever that exact intent was for this part. And number three shows that there's a sensor mounting location and holes for the part. So something like that is, is gonna have a tighter tolerance and you wanna be sure that you have that set up such that it's supported properly and that you get the best geometry out of that part and the best accuracy once that part is printed. So once you put that part into 3D Sprint, the STL is oriented and supported based on the intent or application of the part as we discussed. And you can see that it's, it's printed in such a way that we know we can get flat bottom surfaces in the orientation you see. Our detail is in the upper uh, direction so that there are no supports on that part. It is self-supporting and we know that we can get an accurate area of that part. The supports set up in the holes are set up such that there's minimal cleaning or post-processing and cleaning to get a smooth surface to insert the tubing into that part. Once you put this into 3D Sprint, the STL is then sliced into many two-dimensional layers to be created one layer at a time, and this creates your three-dimensional object at the end of the print. When we slice 3D Sprint, a .pxl or a .f4x file is created and sent to the printer or the controller to print the part. I do want to note that the .pxl files are used for standalone Nextdent 5100 and Fab Pro printers. The .f4x files are used for modular printers. When you go to select a material for the part, the material selected has to also fit, best fit the part application based on the mechanical properties and performance of that material. So there are several materials to pick, choose from. This is from the website. You'll see that for figure four, tough gray 15 and tough gray 10 are two materials. These will have specific properties such that they will best fit your intended application of your part. 
The material is then loaded into the resin tray fitted with a thin film membrane. It is a hand pour inside the standalone, and we will talk a little bit more about the MDM, which is an automatic feed system that's on the modular system. Note that the thin film membrane that is in this tray has minimal adhesion forces, and this allows us for fine supports as well as high speed printing. So it's very important that you take care when you're handling this film, you're not pressing on the film, you don't set it down on a table with objects underneath it. You wanna be real careful in how you handle that and follow the best practices that will come in the packaging that are shown on that particular um, film. These are the key components in operation. You can see from the video, you've got the imager or projector, you've got your resin tray that is filled with material in this section here, and it's your light is coming from underneath the resin tray. It comes from underneath the resin tray and the Z elevator assembly will come up and you do that one layer at a time as you build your part. And it's being built on the print platform, which is shown to the right. The elevator system provides a Z axis motion to create this print. It holds the removable print plate, which the part is built, and the Z-axis motion control is capable of accurately printing as fine as 10 micron layer thicknesses. The layer thicknesses available will be dependent on the material that you've chosen to work with your application. The elevator motion will also be controlled based on the build style to move up and down to continually refresh the material during the print. So it will be different based on the material again that you choose for your application. To post-process the part, when we talk about post-processing, you want to properly clean any uncured material off of the part after printing. Note the part is still green, which means it's not totally post-cured for handling after cleaning. We mentioned this in the safety that you need to handle this with nitrile gloves at this time. The part must be dry and clean of solvents before the post-cure. You want to post-cure after drying, so it when the part is clean, it does not go straight from the solvent into the post-cure unit. It needs to have a specific dry time, which will be called out in the table that you see in the quick reference guide to the right. Once it's dried, then it will go into the post-cure unit you see in the bottom right for the prescribed time that's also given in your quick reference guide above. These best practices you see are a 3D sprint hot link. They're provided for each material uh, with the appropriate steps for each described process. We will continue into the critical hardware identification and maintenance. Critical hardware is defined here in this training as the hardware that the user should be able to identify in the event of an issue and needs to communicate with a 3D system service representative. Note that detailed hardware descriptions are available in the user guide. This means we're not gonna go through this training and identify every component of the system. However, there are general parts that if a user has an issue and they have to make a service call, we want everyone to be able to identify the name of that component or hardware so that they can describe the issue better to the person that's the 3D system service representative. There are links to the standalone user guide here and there will be a link to the user guide for the modular system here. The upper chamber components consist of, at A, you'll see these are the elevator arms. Those hold the print platform during part building. B is the print platform on which the printed part attaches during printing. C is the elevator. The elevator is what we looked at before, and that moves the print platform up and down during a build on the Z axis. D is the resin tray. This holds the resin during the print process. And E is the tension arm. And this is on the standalone system by lowering this onto the resin tray it tensions the resin tray film it's a different tensioning system on the modular with with pneumatics the lower chamber components this again is for the standalone although the projector system and the printer is set up the same but there are other components in the lower chamber of the modular system and we'll look at that in a few minutes the catch tray resin catches the resin it might spill over the resin tray as well as if the Membrane gets punctured and has a spill. This resin tray will catch all of that material so that it does not get down onto your projector. At B, you see the projector lens. UV light is projected through this lens to the bottom layer of print material during the printing process. This is something, if you're in a dusty environment that's 
needs to be kept clean and there are instructions at the link below on how to do that and what to use to clean the lens. There's a door close sensor that you see and see. The machine will not operate unless the door is closed. And D, there, that door will normally be closed that you see labeled D, and that covers up the catch tray access, and it also prevents the UV light from leaking out of the system. The print platform is, again, where the part adheres during the part build. When the print platform is installed, it's important to be sure that when you go to the elevator arms that it is flat and it's flat on each side. There are locating pins on the left and right. And when that goes in, if it's not flat, you're not gonna get good adhesion to the plate and your print may not be successful. So it's very important that that, that platform is flat on the elevator arms. In addition to that, there's a lot going on here, but visually and physically inspect the whole platform to verify that the platform is clean of any resin that's both cured and uncured before starting a build. You can see going from the left, a tool is being used to push out and push the parts off of the platform. It's being done again to clean out in, the, in an IPA rinse. Parts are scraped off the top of the platform. It's wiped down clean. It's inspected to make sure there are no debris left on either the bottom side or the top side of the platform. And this is very important for maintenance and it also is very important for the life of the membrane in each one of the printers because debris and parts like that can puncture and, and bend and cause print defects or even burst the film. So it's very important to visually and physically inspect and clean this platform during use. The resin tray contains the resin during the part building. And you'll see in A there are resin fill levels. Those are graduated markings to show the user the filled level of the resin tray. There may be a material in, in tips that tell you to only fill it to a certain level in the, in the level tray for the standalone printer. The modular printer has an automatic fill system, so it will fill and maintain a level so that you can get good prints. And as it gets down and gets close to empty, there will be prompts for the user to address that. B shows where there are fill channels. These are used to facilitate flow in the tray when the automatic fill is used. C are slots in the tray. These are tension slots. The tension arms fit over these slots, which are spring-loaded in the standalone, and they're pneumatic, as we mentioned, for the modular. And then D is your transparent membrane that's used to pass images through for printing. Again, there's more resin tray care at the links below. Uh, strongly suggested to go and look at that. This resin tray is real critical to having good prints. So you wanna be sure it's kept clean. You wanna be sure your resin tray is kept free of debris. If you feel like you have a failed build and you've got debris in your tray, it's best to filter that material out of the tray before continuing. And again, we mentioned the catch tray. The catch tray has a front and a back side. It's loaded. It, it comes already installed in the printer, but this again will prevent resin spills for getting into the lower chamber should the resin tray member be punctured or if there are other spills. If there are spills or any debris gets onto the glass, it must be cleaned. Uh, it needs to be cleaned with a, a non-ammonia based cleaner, then a non-abrasive cloth, uh, use clean shop air to blow any debris off of both sides. But if there's smudges or lines or marks or things that are on this glass, it will come through and can cause print defects in your part or sometimes part failure. Projector lens care, as I mentioned earlier, this is assuming you shut down or disabled the printer you're inspecting. You don't want to go into this area until you've shut, powered off your printer. And this is where you want to be sure resin is not spilled onto your projector lens and it did get through somehow. Do not attempt to clean that projector. Contact your 3D system service immediately and they can walk with you through the steps you need to do to get this fixed. Your printer, specifically your print tray and your resin tray. One of the critical parts of the modular system is it has a material delivery module. And this contains a module that supplies resin automatically to the printer unit until the bottom is, bottle is empty. And this is located in the lower build chamber. And what you see in this top image is there's a handle to the right, and this is used to pull out the system. And then your bottle is in the top. 
and you'll see the area that's on the right that has the letters that shows you where the bottle goes. And this bottle is what has your material resin. In this part in A, there's an eject button. So when your bottle is pushed into the bottle chute, it will lock in there and you'll feel the feedback when it locks in. Uh, so to get that out, you can't just pull that out. You want to get your bottle out by pressing in on the eject button. The bottle guide, it engages the bottle key, so the bottle is keyed so you get it in the right way so that your um, chip is lined up and so that your coupler is lined up when you put it into the uh, module system. There's a resin bottom coupler, and that's D on the bottom, and that mates to your bottle, and that will is where your material passes through to get pushed up through the pump and into your resin tray. And then you have a chip reader, which is on E on the bottom right. And this has an identification reader that can ID the chip that's inside your material so that you have the right material that you're creating your print for and you're more successful. In addition, on the modular system, the resin bottle uses a bottle that goes into the chute that we just mentioned. And you can see the bottle on the right. It, the bottle has a key, which you see at A, which lets you align that into the bottle chute. And that gets your both of your um, your your chip lined up, as I mentioned, and your coupler. And then you've got a valve cap that's shown at B. Be sure to remove this cap before installing the bottle into the MDM, uh, or it will not lock, and you'll and you'll have to um, pull that back out. And then, when not in use, you should have a stand, as shown here on the right, that your bottle sits upright in the stand. Be sure to put your cap back on before putting that into the stand. From the top view, there's a carrying handle. Always carry the resin bottle by this handle. And there's also a ventilation cap. And it's very important when you install your bottle into your system that you loosen the cap about a quarter turn before installing. That way that you have uh, a vented bottle and your bottle doesn't collapse on you during the pumping. There's also critical hardware in the top. The top of the printer, it has a light stack for status and it also has the extractor the duct panel and the duct panel what that gives you that houses your exhaust fan and it's a connection for external ventilation so you have a place to put that external ventilation when that's required so we're going to go into the to the GUI for the standalone printer and we'll look at this at a high level for both the standalone printer and the modular system and they are different um, the GUI is in the panel on the front of the system and so there's a small touch screen panel on the standalone system. Your default screen is going to be have three tabs. You'll see the status tab, you'll see a material tab, and a settings tab. And again, this is touch screen. So on your status tab, these are the detailed things that, that you will see on here, especially during after a print's complete, which is what the check is showing. Uh, one, you've got the home screen to start and track print progress. This is the name of the build file at B. So whatever where it says my print job, whatever your build file name that's sent over from 3D Sprint, that will be at B. Um, the print preview will show a 3D model of what your image is when you're printing. And at this point with the check means the print has completed. And then D just shows you the current resin that's loaded into the printer that that job was printed with. Also in this screen, you've got the status. This particular screen shows that it's ready to print. You can see the print job that's in the screen above. There's a progress bar that's set at zero at F. Once that begins to go, based on your progress, 25%, 35%, uh, 65%, that will show the percent complete for the current print job dynamically as your job is printing. The time estimated before the print starts is the time estimated to take to build the current job. Once your job starts, that's going to change to the time remaining when the job is being printed. So we'll tell you how much time you have before your job's complete. And then to start the job, you've got the start job button on the bottom. On the material tab, this has uh, access to the menu and its options. And what's shown here is you get the material name at B. You'll have the material part example. So that will give you what you get in your image at C. D is a lot number or the batch number of your material. E will be where it says expiry date. This is your expiration date of the material in the last bottle scanned. And so the last bottle scanned will be what's shown in your lot number and in your material type above. So it's a current bottle of whatever the last 
bottle scan is shown in that in that material. If you need to change material, you can click on the change material and it will prompt you to change to a new bottle. And when we talk about scan, there's a QR code that's on the bottle. So when you start a print, you'll be prompted to scan that. The scanner is located beneath the user panel and you'll see something that looks as the QR is shown in the second image here. For the settings tab, you'll find the IP address of your printer. You can change the language that you want your uh, GUI to, to work under. So you can go to the language section. This one is in English. If you have different language and you just click on the air and you select a language that you want your display to show. The date and time will, can also select your time zone so you have accurate date and time depending on what time zone that you're in. And 3D Connect, this feature is not yet available, but it will allow remote monitoring and support in the future. If you scroll down, because the whole screen will not show what's seen here in the right, you'll have to scroll down to get the system info. And the system info will be the name you gave your printer in 3D Sprint. There's a way to rename your printer in 3D Sprint. You'll also have the serial number assigned to your printer. And then you'll have the firmware version that is being used on your printer at the time. We're going to go into the modular printer GUI, and this is on the uh, modular printer controller panel. And if you see the image on your modular system, you'll have your your work cell or your controller, and in that within that controller, there's a large touch screen, and this is how you control and interface and interact with your system. I will say there's a very detailed link to the, in the user guide that will walk through the things we're going through. I'm only going to hit these at the high level, but um, it's suggested to go through when you get ready to run your modular and go through that system in the user guide. There's a lot of really useful information in here. There's a, on the settings tab, there's a flyout menu button that's on the top left. And this is an overview and display control for options or views on your, on your GUI. The status tab also shows the current status of each printer connected to the controller. This particular controller has eight printers. The printers are called modules. Uh, so you've got module one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each of these is connected to this one controller. You've also got a Q tab that's shown at C, and you're going to have a settings tab at D. That's the Q tab will show the queue of all the print jobs that are loaded or, or have been completed. And the settings tab will show systems controls, network settings, languages, firmware, software, diagnostics, and things like that. Specifically on the status screen, this, this uh, image to the top right shows the current status of each printer connected to the controller. You can note that in this one, module two has been selected, so it shows the expanded view. So it's got a larger view than what you see in module one, five on the left, or module three and seven on the right. Within this, what you'll see on the, on the printer name, to go through the smaller tabs, uh, that will be the name that you give your system. The default name is module, and then whatever number that module defaults to. Your material type is shown here. It identifies the resin type in the printer. The Q tab identifies the current or most recent job sent to the printer. Uh, the time left indicates the amount of time left in a current print job, and that's something we mentioned earlier on the other. And you can see that this is about 75% through, and then there's the amount of time that's left for this particular print. The progress bar is where we're looking at where that information is at. The printer status, where F tells you if you're printing, you're not ready on module five, you're ready on module seven, and you've just completed a print on module three. And then you've also got an abort button, which is shown at, shown at G, so if you need to abort a print. The status screen for the expanded view that we mentioned, this one shows, this one says module one, although the previous image was for module two. But to go through the, the status screen, what you see for the card A, this is the same information as it was before it expanded. For card B, this shows detailed information on the resin bottle that is currently installed in the printer. And then there's card C, it shows a print preview of the build file. And card D is detailed job information on the status of the current print job. E, if you can be expanded, it has more information about the printer. F is also something that can be expanded and it shows the status of the resin tray currently installed in the printer. 
for the Q screen, the Q screen, this is where you see your active print jobs, your pending print jobs, your completed print jobs. You can also use the search print job on A. This allows filtering in the print queue by the job name, material, and the module. So if I want to go see what all um, jobs were, were printed, I can go look for things that were printed on module one, for instance. B is the queue toolbar. This features the controls that can be used to add to and edit the queue. And so there's some different tools to move things up and down the queue to add different jobs to the queue or to delete jobs from the queue. Uh, D is going to be your pending print jobs. This identifies jobs that you're waiting on printer assignment. Uh, e will show your completed print jobs. And then F gives you page control. So you can go to next pages and see the other completed print jobs that you've had previous to that. So if you've got a lot of active print jobs or pending print jobs and you want to see what's completed, you may have to go a page or two over to find what that is. Again, there's a lot more detailed information on this in the user guide. This one has, is at particularly at page 43, but we will add a link that will take you there. And then the settings screen. This shows system controls, network settings. As we mentioned, A will be your system controls. This is where you can restart or shut down the printer. Um, you can go to the network settings, shows you your IP address. Uh, you're looking at Ethernet ports. You can go to uh, C for localization. This is also where you change language and time zones as we did on the previous uh, printer. D shows your software and firmware versions. Note that your controller module will have a software and your firmware will be on your um, modules that you're using. And then there's a diagnostics and logs tab. And this allows the user to export diagnostics to 8 and 3D systems troubleshooting. And that will take us through uh, the basic theory of operation. Again, there's a lot of information on the hardware. There's a lot of information on the, on the interface for both standalone and modular that will be in your user guides at the info center. So these links you can go to or just go to your user guide and sort through and find that information if you need to know a little bit more on, on the things we discuss. Mm -hmm.